Well, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I hope you have all had a wonderful day in your celebrations and that you're time for some relaxing story time. So here we are, we're doing uh, chapters 11 and 12 today in Treasure Island for our chapter book story time. Um, again, this is by Robert Louis Stevenson. And let's just get going. Jim was in his, let's see, he was reunited with his friends um, in the stockade. So that is where we will find them today. Inside the stockade. After the pirates had taken the two jolly boats to shore, the doctor, the squire, and the captain had met in the cabin. They knew that the pirates could take the ship at any time, so they decided to attack the six pirates on board, pull up the anchor, and sail away. Then Hunter came in and said, Jim Hawkins has gone ashore. So the plans changed. The doctor and Hunter quietly took a jolly boat to shore and found their way to the stockade, which was drawn on the map. They climbed over the six foot high fence and inside the area was a blockhouse built over a cool spring of fresh water. This was the best place to defend against any attack. <laughs> they returned to the ship in the jolly boat and went into action. They loaded the boat with food and weapons to take back to the stockade. Joyce, Hunter, and the doctor made the second trip. Joyce and Hunter stayed to guard the stockade. The doctor ordered back to the ship for yet a third trip to bring the rest of the good men to shore. The captain had called out to the pirates on board, asking who would switch to their good side. I'll give you 30 seconds to answer me, he cried. At this, Abraham Gray broke away from the pirates and, with a slashed cheek, dashed to the jolly boat. Then these five men, the captain, the squire, the doctor, Gray, and Redruth, left the Hispaniola and rowed to the safety of the stockade. But the boat was overloaded and hard to steer. They saw in the distance that the big cannon was being set up on the ship's deck. Abraham Gray told them, to their dismay, that Israel Hands had been Flint's gunner. Since the squire was the sharpest shooter in the group, he loaded his weapon and aimed at the ship. However, just as the squire fired, Israel Hands stooped down. The musket ball whistled over him, hitting one of the other four pirates. <laughs> Ah, here's the man with the, with the slashed cheek who ran to the boat to be on their side. Before the squire could load again, the great cannon roared and sent a cannonball toward the small boat. This must have been the first shot that Ben Gunn and I had heard. Luckily, the ball missed them, but the small boat rocked and tipped and sank in the shallow water. No one was hurt, but the supplies sank and only two guns were saved. There was no time to lose, for they could hear the voices of the pirates on the island coming nearer. The five men waded ashore as fast as they could. Just as the men had come up on the stockade, they saw the faces of seven pirates peering over the far corner of the high fence. Shots rang out on all sides. The pirates fired at, and Hunter and Joyce fired from inside the stockade. One of the enemy fell and the rest turned and plunged, plunged into the trees. So here they are, this is where their boat tips over. Hmm. The men began to rejoice at their success, but just then a pistol cracked, a ball whistled through the air, and poor Tom Redruth stumbled and fell on the ground. The squire and the doctor fired back, but did not know where to aim. The captain and Gray bent over the squire's poor fallen gamekeeper. Carefully, they lifted him over the fence and carried him into the log blockhouse. Here they are, lifting him over the fence. <clears throat> The squire dropped down beside him on his knees and kissed his hand, crying like a child. Red Ruth asked if he was dying, and the doctor told him that yes, he was going home. A prayer was said, and the faithful servant passed away. In the meantime, the captain pulled two British flags from his coat. He grabbed them along with his logbook, a pen, and some ink before leaving the ship. He and Hunter propped up a fir tree log against a corner of the blockhouse. The captain climbed to the roof and proudly attached the flag. Then he came into the blockhouse and draped the second flag over the body of Tom Redruth. All through the evening, cannonballs roared and whistled through the air. Ball after ball flew over or fell short and kicked up the soft sand in the, so in the stockade. Only one ball popped in through the roof of the blockhouse and out again through the floor. And it was at that moment that I had climbed the fence and come running toward the stockade, calling to my dear friends. After I had heard the doctor's story, I told mine. The doctor was very interested in this man of the island, Ben Gunn. Is this Ben Gunn a good man, he asked. 
I do not know, sir, said I, and he may be crazy in the head. Aha, uh -huh, said the doctor. A man who has been three years on a desert island might not be in his right mind. That would be expected. Was it cheese he, cheese you said he asked for? Yes, sir, cheese, I answered. Well, Jim, he says, I have a small piece of Parmesan cheese, a nice hard cheese made in Italy. Well, that's for Ben Gunn. Life in the blockhouse was not pleasant. The cold evening breeze came in between the log walls. With the breeze came sand. There was sand in our eyes, sand in our teeth, sand in our, in our suppers. Our chimney was a square hole in the roof and it did not let much smoke out. Most of the smoke stayed inside the blockhouse making us cough and stinging our eyes. But the good Captain Smollett kept us busy. He set up guard duties and had us take turns collecting firewood from outside the stockade. He kept our spirits up, though we knew our wise captain was unhappy. First ship I ever lost, he said. Uh, here's a picture of the inside of the cabin. With the smoke and all the sand. We did not have much food inside the stockade. We knew it would be a month before a ship would be sent from Bristol to search for us. Our best hope, the captain said, was to kill off the pirates until they gave up or ran away with the Hispaniola. If they took the ship, we could search for more food and wait to be rescued. The 19 pirates were now down to about 14. We could hear them roaring and singing late into the night, camped down on the marshy shore. The doctor said many of the pirates would become sick with malaria before long. I was dead tired, as you may imagine. When I got to sleep, I, le I slept like a log of wood. Early the next morning, I awoke to the sound of voices. Flag of truce, I heard someone say. Then with a cry of surprise, it's Silver himself. And at that, I jumped up, rubbed my eyes, and ran to a loophole in the wall. Hmm. Chapter 12 is called The Attack. I wonder what Mr. Silver has up his sleeve. Sure enough, there were two men outside the stockade. One of them was waving a white cloth. The other was Silver himself. They stood knee deep in a low white morning fog that had crawled out of the swamp. Ten to one, this is a trick, said the captain. He called out, who goes? Stand or we fire. Flag of truce, cried Silver. What do you want with your flag of truce, cried our captain. I'm Captain Silver, sir. I'm here to make a bargain, he shouted. Captain Silver, who's he, cried the captain. <laughs> Long John answered, it's me, John Silver, sir. These lads have chosen me as their captain. All I ask is your word, Captain Smollett, to come to terms. Then let me go freely back. My man, said Captain Smollett, I have not the slightest desire to talk to you. If you wish to talk to me, you can come, that's all. That's enough, Captain, shouted Long John cheerily. A word from you is enough. Silver came up to the fence, threw over his crutch, and got a leg up. With great strength and skill, he climbed that fence and dropped to the other side. <laughs> Here he is standing in the fog, right in front of the fence. <clears throat> <clears throat> Silver had terrible hard work getting up the steep land that led to the blockhouse. His crutch sank into the soft sand, but he stuck to it and at last arrived before the captain. Silver saluted. He was dressed up in a long blue coat with brass buttons. A fine hat was set on the, the back of his head. Here you are, my man, said Captain Smollett. You'd better sit down. You'll make me sit outside on the cold sand, Captain, complained Long John. Why, Silver, if you had been an honest sea cook, you might be treated better but you're a common pirate, and here you'll sit. Well, well, Captain, said the sea cook. He sat down on the sand. Then he spied me. It's top of the morning to you, Jim. The doctor too, why, there you all are together like a happy family. If you have anything to say, my man, you better say it, said the captain. Right you are, Captain Smollett. Well, now, that was a good trick last night. One of you is pretty handy with the hand spike but you won't be able to sneak over and kill another man again, I tell you. The captain did not know what Silver was talking about, but I did. Ben Gunn must have paid a late night visit to the pirates while they lay about drunk. I reckoned that we now had one less enemy to deal with. Well, here it is, said Silver. We want that treasure and you want to save your lives. You have a map, haven't you? Perhaps, replied the captain. Oh, well, you have, I know that, said Long John. We want your map. Here, the two men smoked their pipes and eyed each other for quite a while. Now, Silver went on, you give us the treasure map, you do that, and we'll offer you a choice. Here they are talking and smoking on the pipes. 
<laughs> Either you join us and we split the treasure with you, drops you safely ashore somewhere, or you can stay here, you can. We'll leave food and supplies with you. I'll give you my word of honor to send a ship back here to pick you up. Captain Smollett rose from his seat on the porch. Is that all, he said. Every last word, by thunder. If you refuse that, the next time, the next thing you'll see are musket balls. Very good, said the captain. Now you'll hear me. If you'll come up one by one unarmed, I'll take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, you have my word as an Englishman that I'll see you all to Davy Jones below. You can't find the treasure. You can't sail the ship. I'll stand here and tell you so. And they're the last good words you'll get from me. Now go, my lad, and double quick. Silver's face turned red. Give me a hand up. Not I, said the captain. Who'll give me a hand up, Silver roared. Not a man moved. Growling, he crawled along the sand until he got a hold of the porch <coughs> and could get himself up on his crutch. Before an hour's out, he cried, I'll crush your old blockhouse like a rum barrel. And with a dreadful curse, he stumbled off and plowed through the sand. The man with the flag of truce helped him over the fence after four or five tries, then disappeared among the trees. Yikes, here he is walking off with his head wood, or his crutch, excuse me. To your post, to your post, rode the captain. Doctor, take your door, take the door, and Hunter, you take the east side. Joyce, you stand by the west, my man. Mr. Trelawney, you are the best shot. You and Gray will take this long north side with five loopholes. Hawkins, neither you or I are good at the shooting. We'll try to stand, we'll stand by to load muskets and to give a hand. The chill of the fog lifted. The sun began to bake and bake the sand. We flung off our jackets and coats and rolled up our sleeves. Then we stood there in a fever of heat and fear. An hour passed away as we waited and waited. And then came the sounds of attack. Joyce whipped up his musket and fired. Shots rang out from all directions. Several bullets struck the blockhouse. Then all was quiet again until we heard a loud hurrah as pirates leapt from the woods and ran straight to the stockade. A rifle ball sang through the doorway and knocked the doctor's musket into bits. Oh no. The pirates swarmed over the fence like monkeys. Squire and Gray fired again and again. Three pirates fell. Two had bit the dust, one had fled. But four had made it across the fence and into the stockade area. They ran for the blockhouse. Uh-oh, here they are firing inside the cabin. Through their little holes. You see the hole in there. Yikes. The rest of the pirates, still in the woods, shouted and cheered them on. In a moment, the four pirates were upon us. The head of Job Anderson appeared at the middle loophole. Adam, all hands, all hands, he roared in a voice of thunder. At the same moment, another pirate grabbed Hunter's musket and pulled it through the loophole. With one blow, Hunter fell to the floor. Another pirate ran around to the doorway and fell with his cutlass on the doctor. The blockhouse was full of gun smoke. They heard pistol shots and then one loud groan. Out, lads, out, and fight them, fight them in the open. Use your cutlasses, cried the captain. I grabbed a cutlass. You know what a cutlass is? It's a sword, a particular type of sword. <clears throat> uh, grabbed a cutlass and dashed out of the door and into the clear sunlight. Someone was close behind me. Right in front, the doctor was chasing an enemy down the hill. The rest of the pirates were now swarming up the fence to make an end of, an end of us. One man was on the top with one leg over. He had on a red nightcap and held his cutlass in his mouth. But before he could climb over, the battle was finished. The victory was ours. Oh, here's Jim with his cutlass. Gray had put an end to Job Anderson. Another pirate had been shot through the loophole while he tried to shoot into the blockhouse. The doctor struck a fatal blow to another. One of the four who had climbed the fence, oh, of the four who had climbed the fence, only one was alive, and he was climbing back over the fence. In three seconds, the attackers had fled. Five had been killed, but we had paid a price for our victory. Hunter and Joyce both lay dead inside the blockhouse. The squire sat holding the captain, who had been hit by two musket balls. Have they run? Have they run? The captain asked weakly. All the ones that could run, answered the doctor, but there's five of them that will never run again. 
five, cried the captain. That leaves us our four men against their nine. Wow. That is the end of the battle scene and the end of our reading for today. All right, we'll continue on tomorrow night. Again, hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving and we will see you soon. Bye.